So, would like to introduce Professor Prithvi Singh Handal, who is currently the Associate Director of the NCAT, which is National Center for Asphalt Technology, which is based in the US. And uh, NCAT, if you were to be precise, is the largest asphalt road technology center in the world. And prior to NCAT, he, he has served as the Chief Asphalt Road Engineer of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation for 17 years. And uh, he has served as a President, International Association of Asphalt Paving Technology, and also as the Chairman, American Society for Testing and Materials <coughs> International Committee on Road Paving Standards, and Chairman, U.S. Transportation Research Board Committee on Asphalt Roads, and also recently he has developed no, uh, new standards for IRC, which is Indian Road Congress. In, uh, he has also got a Lifetime Achievement Award in Asphalt Road Technology from the International Association of Asphalt Paving Technologists during the annual banquet held in Austin at US. Um, we have invited him personally here because based on the requirements that we have received from the site, wherein they wanted to learn more about the advancement in the construction technologies and how the, I mean, advancement in the construction technologies and also about the maintenance. So, over to you, sir. So you Thank can you. actually highlight. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, compaction we are going to talk about and we are going to talk about uh, these are the topics, purpose of compaction, roller types and compaction procedures, factors affecting compaction, rolling joints, mat inspection, density measurement and specification. The purpose of compaction uh, is just like a common sense, you know, we know why we need to compact. It increases the density and when the density is increased, the structural strength is increased. Reduce the air void, so the durability is ensured. If I have high air voids, water and air will get and oxidize the bitumen. It will also increase the stability, which in turn will be cause the resistance to rutting. Also, after compaction, I got a smoother surface. This is a comfort for the motorist. You know. Roller can be three types, static steel wheel, pneumatic tire and vibratory. Here is just an example of a three wheel static roller. Here is a tandem steel wheel roller, no, vi no vibration. Here is in a, st a tandem ro uh, steel wheel roller with no vibration. You see the uh, power drum is in the front and the known power drum is in the back. Then we have pneumatic tire roller which might have uh, four tires on one side, five on the other side, so that we can compact the entire width of the roller. The tire pressure in the pneumatic tire roller uh, should not be too low. On the right side you see example where the tire pressure is too low. If it is too low, it won't cause any compaction. If it is uh, uh, too high, which is the bottom case, uh, then you might have some problem with the indentation. So, it has to be the right amount and your pneumatic tire roller, uh, the manual will give you uh, how much uh, uh, pressure to put in there. You will be guidance in that manual. Here is a vibratory roller, uh, another vibratory roller and the factors are affecting the vibratory compaction is the roller dead weight, the impact frequency, impact amplitude and we will talk about that. So, here in this picture schematic, you can see here on the right side, we have a dead weight and then we have a rotating weight which causes uh, the, the vibration. In the middle, you see a sort of a oval shape type thing in only here which is causing the, uh, there is a rotating weight which will cause the vibration. Now, when we say, uh, what is frequency? Each vibrator has a set, set setting for frequency, high frequency, low frequency, medium or whatever. Also it is setting for amplitude. When I say high frequency, uh, that means I am providing those impact vibration very close to each other. Like on the left side, uh, I, I, I am rolling with the high frequency, the impacts are very close to each other. On the right side, with the low frequency, the impact points are far, uh, far apart from each other. So, if, if I want to get a good compaction, uh, I should always have high frequency. So, that will be more efficient. 
and then I have amplitude. Amplitude is the movement of the drum, vibratory drum, uh, up and down. So in the in the left side I have a higher amplitude, in the right side I have a lower amplitude. So if I am going to uh, compact a dBm, which might be like 50 or 60 millimeter uh, depth, you know, I want to use a higher amplitude because my lift thickness is more. But if I have to compact like 30 or 40 millimeter of 40 millimeter of BC, then I would use a lower Im uh, amplitude, you know. So it depends upon the thickness of the of the mix, you know. So what frequency and amplitude to use? You can see here you got a thin lift. Uh, frequency should be maximum. Amplitude should be low. We got a thick. Then again the frequency should be, should be maximum, and amplitude should be high. Uh, I don't know what, under what circumstances you use a lo uh, lower frequency. Maybe the mix you don't want too many too much compaction purposely, then you might have to go to with a lower frequency. Compaction procedures. There are three rolling stages. We have a breakdown rolling, usually with a vibratory roller. We have an intermediate rolling, usually with a pneumatic tire roller, and then we have finish rolling with a tandem steel wheel roller. Finished rolling doesn't cause much compaction. It just kind of takes out all the marks and everything. You know, just gives a smooth surface. So here is the paving, uh, directional paving. I start like with number one, number two, three, four, five, and six. That way I am covering the entire entire lane width. Mat must be rolled hot. 85 to 150. I, if I start at 150, I must uh, stop it at 85 or 80 degrees Celsius. You know, if I'm below 80 degrees Celsius, then I'm not doing much any compaction actually. So how many passes are required? It depends upon the mix, the lift thickness. To do that, uh, I have to first uh, go with a control strip before I start on the project. I have to build a control strip. I, I have to have a nuclear gaze. I don't see too many nuclear gaze in in in, the, in India actually, because this is this is a, you give, give you instant reading after every pass. Uh, you use a nuclear gaze to find the density to get the optimum density. So you have to plot this thing on your control strip. For that project, you have to find out how many passes you need. So here. I have uh, left side I have a density and uh, on the x axis I have the number of passes and I am measuring the density by the nuclear gaze and then I see that after three or four pass after fourth pass it starts to come down. So there is no use in compacting more than four pass because there is a decompaction is taking place. So this idea is that I keep on compacting is not a good idea because sometimes you can have a decompaction. So this has to be set up you know, right at the project, uh, beginning of project. Every project you have to have a control strip where you set up this rolling pattern, how many passes you would apply. Factors affecting the compaction, layer or mat thickness, air and base temperature, mixed lay down temperature, wind velocity or solar flux. These are the factors which will affect the compaction. This will the factor which will affect how much time I have to roll the mat before it cools down below 80 degrees Celsius. These are, these are the factors will determine the time available for rolling. And there are some curves available. This one is a very simple curve. Uh, on the left side, you enter with the mat thickness, whether you have. 25 millimeter, 50 or 75 millimeter. Supposing I have 75 millimeter mat thickness, from there I come horizontally, and supposing my mix temperature is 150 and the base temperature is 0 degree Celsius, so I have the middle line, I intersect that with the middle line and then up, go upward and read the time. It might be like I might have like 35 minutes or whatever. Now, this does not take into account the, the air velocity. Uh, air, air velocity is very important. If you got wind blowing, uh, then you will have even less time for rolling. There are some nomograph available for that as well, but 
people don't use that much. But this is a good, give you some idea how much time you have. Finish rolling to be completed before the mat cools to 80 degrees Celsius. After that, rolling won't do you any good. Now we'll talk, talk about rolling transverse and longitudinal joint. In the lay down, we saw how we are making the joint, but now we are going to talk about how we compact them. So this was a transverse joint. We make it like we described in the previous uh, uh, lecture. Now the, the ideal way to roll a transverse joint is to roll sideways, but nobody does that. Even in the US, nobody does that because thereby you don't have enough space for the roller to go back and forth. So you have to place some boards on the side, on the shoulder. Uh, on both sides, you, you see the two boards on the top, two at the bottom, so the roller can go back and forth. No vibration. So this will really ensure that the cold and hot and the joint is get very smooth. But to my knowledge, this one is this uh, technique is uh, nobody is using it. Now rolling about the hot joint, the longitudinal joint, you see here there is a cold and hot written there. Cold means this mat was already uh, made maybe in the morning or whatever you know and hot is the new material I placed on the side lane now how do I roll the joint this is a longitudinal joint so the first roller pass should be mostly on the hot side mostly on the loose hot mix and about 150 millimeter on the cold mat this is the best technique to get a good longitudinal joint. So the first pass has to be like that. We, we must follow that always. And here you see the picture. In this picture, the roller is rolling the hot mat on the left side. And on the right side, you have the cold mat, the so-called cold mat or previously laid mat. And you can see here that there is about 150 millimeter overlap on the cold side. Most of the roller is on the hot mat on the loose side. Inspection of the finished pavement, we got to look at the texture, smoothness, density. After the compaction, we got to look at these. Is the texture uniform? Now, obviously, you can see that only by eyes, you know, but here, sometimes you can use your shoes, you know, sometimes the mat might start to whether it's firm or not, it gives you some idea uh, with your shoes as well. And testing for smoothness, uh, there's a rolling uh, straight edge. Uh, also, you can use a plain uh, straight edge to test the rolling, the smoothness in the longitudinal direction. Density test is a, we can do nuclear density or we can do the core density. Now, nuclear density is a, suitable for controlling mat density during construction. Nuclear density is good for the contactor because sometimes the buyer or the owner will accept the compaction based upon the core. The core, be, the core will be taken either at the end of the day or the following day. So the contactor uh, has to use the nuclear gauge to make sure that the density is uh, is appropriate uh, and uh, while he is under construction he can still have num more number of passes or whatever he, could, he can do something to take care of it he cannot do anything the, on the following day so nuclear density is good for contactor and core density is mostly used for acceptance here is the nuclear gaze we must use that here we are taking a course out of the mat once the mat has cooled down to air temperature and when I say entire mat if you got like 40, 40 millimeter BC the entire 40 millimeter BC should be up to the room temperature then you can take a good core on the same day even otherwise you take the core the following day here is it take, uh, taking a core out of that when you take the core if the core breaks right here between BC and DBM you got a problem with the tech coat. Either you don't have any tech coat, you got too much tech coat. So here is an example of uh, uh, correlation of core and nuclear density. 
nuclear gas dense may not give you absolute density core actually really give you the real density because you are taking the core weighing in the air weighing in the water nuclear gas can give you just only relative density because nuclear gas reads uh, deep into the pavement supposing uh, you got 40 mm bc nuclear gas is also reading part of the dbm and your dbm might have different density you know so nuclear gas is is good for uh, relative density that okay you got you got the optimum density so for every project you should take uh, 10 cores and 10 nuclear uh, gas density side by side and come up with a difference what you call fuzz factor you would come up with the dis- difference that okay nuclear is reading more than the core or less than the core and you adjust then for the remaining project you adjust the nuclear gas density to coincide with the core density now method of specifying bad density how much compaction is achieved i can use different methods different baseline to accept the density first, first is the percentage of control strip density i make a control strip on the first day i get the maximum op- optimum rolling pattern i get a particular density on that then on remaining project i have to meet 98% of that that's one one way we are not doing that in india uh, and that's not a good method actually second is percent of lab density we were doing that but now we are doing the third one percent of theoretical maximum density uh, now that's the one which is in irc 111 which i drafted so the third method is the one we are using second method is the percent of lab density and we had discussion yesterday about that uh, whatever density i am getting in the lab of the marshal compacted mars specimen uh, i have to obtain maybe 98 or 97% of that in the field so that's that's one way but the percent of theoretical is the is the best one because uh, if i measure the theoretical maximum density on that day Uh, i will say that i want to achieve 92% of that that means i don't want more than 8% voids so from the third method i am getting air voids right away and i am concerned more about air voids i don't want more than 8% air voids so that the payment will fail i don't care what kind of lab density you i got or whatever i i am more concerned about the air voids in the completed project i am not going to go back and Well, well, supposing you are investigating a project after five five years, all you can just do is uh, measure the lab, uh, the the air voids. You can take a core, you can measure the density, you can lose loosen up the mix, you know, take uh, measure the theoretical mix density, and you find the uh, air voids. You cannot cannot go back and retrieve the lab density for that day five years ago, you know. so the third is the method we are using in india right now and that's the best method right now he has just give you a compaction specification of different types of like uh, air voids on the left side uh, percent of tmd which is theoretical maximum density uh, that percent of laboratory percent of control strip in place air voids same thing as on the left side these are kind of give you like equivalent figures you know like percent of tmd if it is 90% you you have 7% air voids now we do want uh, for our uh, job we want 92% in the mrth for sma we want uh, 93% or 94% i forget and this is the last slide of uh, compaction uh, this is the paving going on near the white house uh, long time ago and you can see the uh, hot mix is is being brought uh, uh, in the mule mule carts not not in the truck and people are laying it uh, by hand uh, in here these are the mule carts with the horse driven carts with the hot mix is brought in here and this guy you know with the steam engine roller is waiting until they finish the finish the laying which will take long long time by hand and you see in here is not very good clear on the horse back there is a overseer you see see that overseer is on the horse back is looking at the paving operation so with the, everything is done uh, good materials good lay down good mix compaction we got a good road 
So with that, uh, uh, are there any questions for compa compaction? Yeah, tandem steel roller, last one, uh, called finish roller, to iron out uh, any kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Ah. Most of the last rolling is in Well, I, I, I don't know, depends upon the mix. If sometimes uh, uh, if your mix is kind of soft, then PTR might leave some impressions, you know. So then you have to use a steel wheel. So the common practice throughout the world is to use a steel wheel to iron out. Uh, big, big tandem will not give any vibration, vibration without vibration vibration is the only in the breakdown you are applying vibrator uh, then after that pneumatic gives you some additional compaction there are two schools of thought on pneumatic roller some people think there is no need for pneumatic roller vibratory roller has already called compaction and you just use a tandem wheel to iron out the thing you know then the other school of thought is that uh, vibrati the pneumatic tire roller gives you some kneading action. So your surface of the mix becomes kneaded and becomes more waterproof. I have not seen much, much proof either way, you know. That is like thinking of uh, some people that it causes kneading action. And, and the last slide you have shown, hmm. you showed in the lab, this is the four person air The last one which I showed you, they are equivalent. Ah. Yeah. After compaction, we are uh, in, in, the, in this slide, ah, this we were uh, we were, were showing. Yeah, we were showing that the requirement uh, in this case is the 7 percent air voids. You see here? To get 7 percent air voids on the left side, on the right side same thing, I have to have requirement of 93 percent of theoretical maximum density. Right now in MORTH and IRSC 111 which I developed, uh, we have a 92 percent which is uh, which is okay used in many countries. Then what is that 4 percent sir? The this one? This one? Yep, first box. Oh, the, oh, this one, yeah. Okay, this one is 4% air voids in the mixed design I did. In the mixed design, I, I, I did 4%. And now I'm assuming that at the time of construction, I got 7% air void. And the next two years, the traffic will cause from 7 to 4% air void. The traffic will further densify the mat. It always does, you know, to hopefully get my 4% air void which I use in design. That is an assumption. It, it might get 3 percent, who knows, you know. It might get hung up at 5 percent. Depends upon when you did the job. Supposing you did do the job in April and hot summer comes, you know. Fresh job, you know, and hot summer weather will densify it real quick, you know. Supposing you do, do the job in October, the winter traffic is not going to densify too much, you know. Uh, so, it is an assumption, you know. You always make. Uh, yeah, you got a good point. I, I should have explained that that the four percent means that the that's a mixed design air words. I'll tr I will achieve maybe hopefully after two years. And one more talk. You mm. are uh, listing out the signs of uh, overburnt mixture and other things like blue smoke coming out. Yeah. The slump is there. Right. Suppose we get a slump mix. Mm. What is to do? Usually the contractor will not take it back or again reheat or do anything. I don't know. The, the, maybe they, they don't hear this. Uh, but the question is that uh, supposing the mix has slumped in the truck, you know, it's all level, just like concrete. What do we do? Is the contract is going to waste it, or do we accept or don't accept it? How, how to get it uh, as acceptable? Yes, so truck is there. You, you ask a very good question. I never thought about that, you know. Uh, how to, uh, we, we said that there is a lot of moisture in there. Yes. Because of the moisture content, you know, moisture causes, you know. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. to make it a useful, acceptable mix? Generally, 
I, I, I don't know, but you generally they will lay, you know, that's yeah, the real, so real life. They will, they will lay it off and, and, and pray, pray to the God that nothing will happen in that stretch, you know. That's all you can do. I've seen many specimens will say that supposing rains come, you know, right. Many specimens will say that whatever trucks are in the transit, you allow them to lay. Now, the surface is wet, right. And you are still there, two or three tricks on the way, you know, you, the paper is going, you just, you are not going to, rain might last for three, four hours, you know, you are not going to wait for that. So you just use that. I have not seen too many failures with that. It might fail, it may not fail. But uh, being realistic, most of the specifications in the US at least they allow, that whatever trucks are in the transit, let them, you know, lay down. So same thing will happen uh, in your uh, slum mix, mix, you know. Yeah. But I don't have any answer. I don't think you can correct that. I don't know how you uh, reheat the whole thing. You know, it's, uh, yeah. Taken back. Yeah, yeah. Any other question anybody has on compaction? Hmm. Go ahead. Hmm? Preference is given to DTL. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, uh, regarding the question uh, about the compaction, sir. Hmm, okay. Uh, as per IRC paper 1, it is clearly stating that if force, uh, that force density should be more than 90% of DMM. Right, uh-huh. Right. But uh, that compaction may depend upon various parameters, sir. The temperature may be the mix or whatever it may be. Right. And if if the compaction is uh, we received a compaction less than 92 percent sir okay is there any remedial solution or uh, we have to discard the area sir? No, there, there, there is no solution to that. But what I have seen is that at least in the U.S. Army, uh, if you are like a borderline, supposing instead of 92 percent, you achieved like 91.8 or 91.5 or something, you know, then uh, the U.S. Army will allow you to roll with a pneumatic tire roller on the following day when it is hot. Now, they think that uh, pneumatic tire roller on a hard day can cause some additional compaction, but I am not sure. Uh, but uh, I don't know any way you can achieve that. Once it, the mat is cooled down, in my opinion, there is no way you can, you can compact it uh, uh, further to meet that 92 percent. Because as you know, sir, generally we will take the core after 24 hours. Yeah, that's why you. That's why the contractor should take the nuclear gauge. You know, that's why I said, while the construction is taking place, keep on taking the nuclear gauge reading, so you know where you stand, mm -hmm. and you already have a correlation between the nuclear gauge density reading and the core, right from the beginning of the project. You know, so the contractor should be more alert. The person who is going to accept that payment, they don't care. They will take the core next day and it fails, it fails, you know. It's the contractor who has to safeguard his interest by using a nuclear gauge at the time of compaction. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay.